Chapter Thirteen of the Hidden Hand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget. The Hidden Hand by E. D. E. N. Southworth. Chapter Thirteen. Mara's Memories. In the shade of the apple tree again, she saw a rider draw his rein, and gazing down with a timid grace, she felt his pleased eyes read her face. Whittier. Dear Mara, I cannot understand your strong attachment to that bronzed and grizzled old man, who has besides treated you so barbarously," said Herbert. "'Is he bronzed and gray? asked Mara, looking up with gentle pity in her eyes and tone. "'Why, of course he is. He is sixty-two. He was forty-five when I first knew him, and he was handsome then. At least I thought him the very perfection of manly strength and beauty and goodness. True, it was the mature, warm beauty of the Indian summer for he was more than middle-aged. But it was very genial to the chilly, loveless morning of my own early life, said Mara, dropping her head upon her hand and sliding into reminiscences of the past. Dear Mara, I wish you would tell me all about your marriage and misfortune, said Herbert, in a tone of the deepest sympathy and respect. Yes, he was very handsome, continued Mrs. Rock, speaking more to herself than to her companion. His form was tall, full, and stately, his complexion warm, rich, and glowing. His fine face was lighted up by a pair of strong, dark gray eyes, full of fire and tenderness, and was surrounded by waving masses of jet-black hair and whiskers. They are gray now, you say, Herbert? Gray and grizzled, and bristling up around his hard face like thorn-bushes around a rock in winter, said Herbert bluntly, for it enraged his honest but inexperienced boyish heart to hear this wronged woman speak so enthusiastically. Ah, it is winter with him now, but then it was glorious Indian summer. He was a handsome, strong, and ardent man. I was a young, slight, pale girl, with no beauty but the cold and colorless beauty of a statue, with no learning but such as I had picked up from a country school, with no love to bless my lonely life, for I was a friendless orphan, without either parents or relatives, and living by sufferance in a cold and loveless home. Poor girl, murmured Herbert, in almost inaudible tones. Our log cabin stood beside the military road, leading through the wilderness to the fort where he was stationed. And, oh, when he came riding by each day upon his noble coal-black steed, and in his martial uniform, looking so vigorous, handsome, and kingly, he seemed to me almost a god to worship. Sometimes he drew rein in front of the old oak tree that stood in front of our cabin, to breathe his horse, or to ask for a draught of water. I used to bring it to him. Oh, then when he looked at me, his eyes seemed to send new warmth to my chilled heart, when he spoke, too, his tone seemed to strengthen me. While he stayed, his presence seemed to protect me. Ay, such protection as vultures give to doves, covering and devouring them, muttered Herbert to himself. Mrs. Rock, too absorbed in her reminiscences to heed his interruptions, continued. One day he asked me to be his wife. I do not know what I answered. I only know that when I understood what he meant, my heart trembled with instinctive terror at its own excessive joy. We were privately married by the chaplain at the fort. There were no accommodations for the wives of officers there. And, besides, my husband did not wish to announce our marriage until he was ready to take me to his princely mansion in Virginia. Humph! grunted Herbert inwardly, for comment. But he built me a pretty cabin in the woods below the fort, furnished it simply, and hired a half-breed Indian woman to wait on me. Oh, I was too happy! To my wintry spring of life summer had come, warm, rich, and beautiful. There is a clause in the marriage service which enjoins the husband to cherish his wife. I do not believe many people ever stop to think how much is in that word. He did. He cherished my little, thin, chill, feeble life, until I became strong, warm, and healthful. Oh, even as the blessed sun warms and animates and glorifies the earth, causing it to brighten with life, and blossom with flowers and bloom with fruit, so did my husband enrich and cherish and bless my life. Such happiness could not, and it did not last. Of course not, muttered Herbert to himself. At first the fault was in myself. Yes, Herbert, it was. You need not look incredulous or hope to cast all the blame on him. Listen, happy, grateful, adoring as I was, I was also shy, timid, and bashful, never proving the deep love I bore my husband, except by the most perfect self-abandonment to his will. All this deep, though quiet, devotion he understood as mere passive obedience, void of love, as this continued he grew uneasy, and often asked me if I cared for him at all, or if it were possible for a young girl like me to love an old man like himself. A very natural question, thought Herbert. Well, I used to whisper in answer, yes, and still yes, 
But this never satisfied Major Warfield. One day, when he asked me if I cared for him the least in the world, I suddenly answered that if he were to die I should throw myself across his grave, and lie there until death should release me. Whereupon he broke into a loud laugh, saying, Methinks the lady doth protest too much. I was already blushing deeply at the unwanted vehemence of my own words, although I had spoken only as I felt, the very, very truth. But his laugh and his test so increased my confusion, that in fine, that was the first and last time I ever did protest. Like Lear's Cordelia, I was tongue-tied, I had no words to assure him. Sometimes I wept to think how poor I was in resources to make him happy. Then came another annoyance. My name and fame were freely discussed at the fort. A natural consequence, sighed Herbert. The younger officers discovered my woodland home, and often stole out to reconnoitre my calm. Among them was Captain Lenore, who, after he had discovered my retreat, picked acquaintance with Laura, my attendant. Making the woodland sports his pretext, he haunted the vicinity of my cabin, often stopping at the door to beg a cup of water, which, of course, was never denied, or else to offer a bunch of partridges, or a brace of rabbits, or some other game, the sports of his gun, which equally, of course, was never accepted. One beautiful morning in June, finding my cabin door open, and myself alone, he ventured unbidden across my threshold, and by his free conversation and bold admiration offended and alarmed me. Some days afterward, in the mess-room at the fort, being elevated by wine, he boasted among his messmates of the intimate terms of friendly acquaintance upon which he falsely asserted that he had the pleasure of standing with Warfield's pretty little favorite, as he insolently called me. When my husband heard of this, I learned for the first time the terrific violence of his temper. It was awful. It frightened me almost to death. There was a duel, of course. Lenore was very dangerously wounded, scarred across the face for life, and was confined many weeks to his bed. Major Warfield was also slightly hurt and laid up at the fort for a few days, during which I was not permitted to see him. Is it possible that even then he did not see your danger, and acknowledge your marriage, and call you to his bedside? inquired Herbert impatiently. No, no, if he had, all after suffering had been spared. No, at the end of four days he came back to me, but we met only for bitter reproaches on his part, and sorrowful tears on mine. He charged me with coldness, upon account of the disparity in our years, and of the preference for Captain Lenore, because he was a pretty fellow. I knew this was not true of me. I knew that I loved my husband's very footprints better than I did the whole human race besides. But I could not tell him so then. Oh, in those days, though my heart was so full, I had so little power of utterance. There he stood before me, he that had been so ruddy and buoyant, now so pale from loss of blood, and so miserable, that I could have fallen and groveled at his feet in sorrow and remorse at not being able to make him happy. There are some persons whom we can never make happy. It is not in them to be so, commented Herbert. He made me promise never to see or to speak to Lenore again, a promise eagerly given, but nearly impossible to keep. My husband spent as much time with me as he possibly could spare from his military duties, and looked forward with impatience to the autumn, when it was thought that he would be at liberty to take me home. He often used to tell me that we should spend our Christmas at his house, Hurricane Hall, and that I should play Lady Bountiful, and distribute Christmas gifts to the Negroes, and that they would love me. And, oh, with what joy I anticipated that time of honor and safety and careless ease, as an acknowledged wife, in the home of my husband. There, too, I fondly believed our child would be born. All his old tenderness returned for me, and I was as happy, if not as wildly joyful, as at first. "'Twas but a lull in the storm,' said Herbert. "'Aye, twas but a lull in the storm, or rather before the storm. I do think that from the time of that duel Lenore had resolved upon our ruin. As soon as he was able to go out he haunted the woods around my cabin, and continually lay in wait for me. I could not go out even in the company of my maid Laura to pick blackberries, or wild plums, or gather forest roses, or to get fresh water at the spring, without being intercepted by Lenore and his offensive admiration. He seemed to be ubiquitous. He met me everywhere, except in the presence of Major Warfield. I did not tell my husband, because I feared that if I did he would have killed Lenore, and died for the deed. Humph! it would have been good riddance of bad rubbish in both cases, muttered Herbert, under his teeth. But instead of telling him, I confined myself strictly to my cabin. One fatal day my husband, on leaving me in the morning, said that I need not wait up for him at night, for that it would be very late when he came home, even if he came at all. 
He kissed me very fondly when he went away. Alas! Alas! It was the last, last time. At night I went to bed disappointed, yet still so expectant that I could not sleep. I know not how long I had waited thus, or how late it was when I heard a tap at the outer door, and heard the bolt undrawn, and a footstep enter, and a low voice asking, Is she asleep? And Laura's reply in the affirmative. Never doubting it was my husband, I lay there in pleased expectation of his entrance. He came in, and began to take off his coat in the dark. I spoke, telling him that there were matches on the bureau. He did not reply, at which I was surprised. But before I could repeat my words, the outer door was burst violently open. Hurried footsteps crossed the entry. A light flashed into my room. My husband stood in the door, in full military uniform, with a light in his hand, and the aspect of an avenging demon on his brow. And, horror upon horrors, the half-undressed man in my chamber was Captain Lenore. I saw and swooned away. "'But you were saved, you were saved,' gasped Herbert, white with emotion. "'Oh, I was saved, but not from sorrow, not from shame. I awoke from that deadly swoon to find myself alone, deserted, cast away. Oh, torn out from the warmth and light and safety of my husband's heart, and hurled forth shivering, faint and helpless, upon the bleak world, and all this in twenty-four hours. Ah, I did not lack the power of expression then. Happiness had never given it to me. Anguish conferred it upon me. That one fell stroke of fate cleft the rock of silence in my soul, and the fountain of utterance gushed freely forth. I wrote to him, but my letters might as well have been dropped into a well. I went to him, but was spurned away. I prayed him with tears to have pity on our unborn babe, but he laughed aloud in scorn, and called it by an opprobrious name. Letters, prayers, tears, were all in vain. He never had acknowledged our marriage. He now declared that he would never do so. He discarded me, disowned my child, and forbade us ever to take his name. Oh, Mara, and you but seventeen years of age, without a father or a brother or a friend in the world to employ an advocate, exclaimed Herbert, covering his face with his hands and sinking back. Nor would I have used any of these agencies had I possessed them. If my wifehood and motherhood, my affections and my helplessness were not advocates strong enough to win my cause, I could not have borne to employ others. Oh, Mara, with none to pity or to help, it was monstrous to have abandoned you so. No, hush, consider the overwhelming evidence against me. I considered it even in the tempest and whirlwind of my anguish, and never once blamed, and never once was angry with my husband. For I knew, but not he, the terrible circumstantial evidence had ruined me. Ay, but did you not explain it to him? How could I, alas, when I did not understand it myself? How Lenore knew that Major Warfield was not expected home that fatal night, how he got into my house, whether by conspiring with my little maid, or by deceiving her, or, lastly, how Major Warfield came to burst in upon him so suddenly, I did not know, and do not to this day. But you told Major Warfield all that you have told me? Oh, yes, again and again, calling heaven to witness my truth. In vain. He had seen with his own eyes, he said. Against all I could say or do, there was built up a wall of scornful incredulity, on which I might have dashed my brains out to no purpose. O oh, Mara, Mara, with none to pity or to save, again exclaimed Herbert. Yes, said the meek creature, bowing her head, God pitied and helped me. First he sent me a son, that grew strong and handsome in body, good and wise in soul. Then he kept alive in my heart faith and hope and charity. He enabled me, through long years of unremitting and ill-requited toil, to live on, loving against anger, waiting against time, and hoping against despair. "'Why did you leave your western home, and come to Staunton, Mara?' asked Herbert. "'To be where I could sometimes hear of my husband, without intruding on him. I took your widowed mother in, because she was his sister. Though I never told her who I was, lest she should wrong and scorn me as he had done. When she died I cherished you, Herbert, first because you were his nephew.' but now, dear boy, for your own sake also. And I, while I live, will be a son to you, madam. I will be your constant friend at Hurricane Hall. He talks of making me his heir. Should he persist in such blind injustice, the day I come into the property I shall turn it all over to his widow and son. But I do not believe that he will persist. I, for my part, still hope for the best. I also hope for the best, for whatever God wills is sure to happen, and his will is surely the best." "'Yes, Herbert, I also hope, beyond the grave,' said Mara Rock, with a wan smile. The little clock that stood between the tall, plated candlesticks on the mantelpiece struck twelve, and Mara rose from her seat, saying, 
Travers, poor fellow, will be home to his dinner. Not a word to him, Herbert, please. I do not wish the poor lad to know how much he has lost, and above all, I do not wish him to be prejudiced against his father. You are right, Mara, said Herbert, for if he were told, the natural indignation that your wrongs would arouse in his heart would totally unfit him to meet his father in a proper spirit, and that event for which I still hope, a future and a perfect family union. Herbert Grayson remained a week with his friends, during which time he paid the quarter's rent, and relieved his adopted mother of that cause of anxiety. Then he took leave, and departed for Hurricane Hall, on his way to Washington City, where he was immediately going to pass his examination, and await his appointment. End of chapter 13